Chapter 1 of Petticoat Government, Volume 3. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Mark Leader. Chapter 1 of Petticoat Government, Volume 3, by Francis Milton Trollope. The season was now arrived for the display of contemporary talent in the annual exhibition of the Royal Academy. Judith had been taken in proper style by Mrs. Dorking to the private view, but as Frederick was by her side and more than usually agreeable, and as her attention was, to say the least, pretty constantly divided on that occasion between the celebrities who walked on the floor and those who were suspended on the walls, she took an early opportunity after the departure of Mrs. Chilbert to visit the splendid display of national talent, national industry, and national wealth with the faithful friend who was only too happy to follow her wherever she liked to go, who was ready to pause where she paused and to move on when she moved on. Young as Judith was, and ignorant as till very lately she had been of everything deserving the name of art, she was not now such an ignorant novice as not to feel the heavy change produced upon her feelings by going from one side of the Trafalgar Square gallery to the other. For sometimes she experienced so great a sensation of displeasure from the exchange that she felt strongly inclined to protest that she would never look at any newly painted canvas again, for that there was something in the glare and dazzling freshness that made her head ache and caused her altogether to feel ill and uncomfortable. After my constant visits to the dear old gallery, it seems like the greediness of a child who throws aside a delicate nectarine for the sake of munching a huge apple. To come here, said she to Miss Tolbridge, the first time they entered the Royal Academy together which was at that well-chosen early hour which those faithful allies always selected for seeing pictures. "'Certainly, my dear, the two galleries will not bear a comparison,' replied Miss Tolbridge. "'But I don't think it's quite fair to make one.' "'Oh, how true that is!' cried the reasonable Judith, instantly feeling that the apple might be a precious thing as well as the nectarine, and that nothing but the simplicity of folly or the sophistication of affectation, could so place them in juxtaposition as to make one lessen the value of the other. My dear Miss Tolridge, that little word of yours has given me an invaluable lesson, continued Judith, passing her arm under that of her companion, and preparing herself for what she had never attempted before, namely, a deliberate examination of the pictures. In the first place, you know that we have here the miscellaneous labors of a most miscellaneous set, many of them perhaps early attempts, and many more produced not by the bright and almost godlike inspirations of genius, but by the necessity of imitating a homely set of features, male or female, young or old, in order that the artist may live. I wish, she resumed, after shutting her eyes for a moment, I wish that they were not so very bright but I dare say they will become less painful to the eyes when the tints are mellowed a little by time, and when there are not so many of them to be seen together. Yes, I dare say it would be so, replied Miss Tolbridge, and besides, if we knew all the people, she added, it would be a great deal more interesting. Do you think it would, returned Judith, rather doubtingly. But let us sit down here for a moment, said she, drawing her companion towards a convenient bench, for I feel rather giddy. The whole effect is perfectly dazzling. They sat down and occupied themselves silently for several minutes in looking at what was within their reach, Miss Tolbridge consulting her catalogue the whole time with unwearied industry, while Judith was indulging in meditation. I wished, said the latter at length, I wish, Miss Tolbridge, that I could persuade myself that all the weary hours that have been bestowed on this world of canvas had been paid for, liberally paid for. If I were sure of this, the looking at them would be much less painful. 
painful my dear child do not stay a moment longer if you find it painful cried miss tolbridge eagerly oh yes i must stay for i want to look at a great many of them i did not exactly mean bodily pain said judith but i cannot help thinking how dreadful it must be to labor so for an uncertainty and even then suppose the work was ordered a portrait for instance like that fat gentleman before us in his fine satin waistcoat how do we know but that the poor artist may be conscious of really possessing some talent perhaps he may feel that he could paint a group of naked children at play that might look like so many living creatures suddenly suspended in their movements and thrown upon the canvas as it were by magic rubens does that you know continually but only fancy the misery of an artist who could do something a little like it fancy his misery at being obliged to do such a thing as that in order to avoid starvation there's pain in that idea is there not miss tolbridge indeed there is replied her companion very dolorously judith sat on for some minutes in perfect silence meditating sadly enough upon her uncle worthington and her aunt worthington and her cousin charles worthington and upon the cruel ill luck which prevented a meeting between them which would be likely to give so much pleasure to them all for at that moment her two maiden aunts her intended mother-in-law and even her intended husband were quite forgotten we must not go till we've had a look at mr landseer's picture said miss tolbridge interrupting her reverie and they rose and moved on these dogs said judith as she stood before a great picture of the great artist these dogs miss tolbridge overthrow all my amiable theories about old pictures and new pictures and the mellowing effects of time and the inspiring result of patronage when warmed by royal companionship and noble friendships not to mention a multitude of other fanciful maybes by which for this hour past i have been endeavouring to account for the difference between what has been and what is but notwithstanding all my deep consciousness of my own ignorance nothing will persuade me that dogs were ever before portrayed with such exquisite skill as those before me the shepherd great as it is may have had an equal in the good old days that are gone but the dogs never they are very good dogs indeed replied miss tolbridge in an accent so utterly unsympathetic that poor judith felt positively ashamed of herself and blushed the genuine blush of sixteen and a half at having been guilty of enthusiasm had she followed her first impulse she would have gone in search of the servant and the carriage directly but she was too good-natured to do this for she had established it as a rule whenever they made one of their morning visits to trafalgar square that the adventure should conclude with a visit to ferrance the pastry cook judith having discovered beyond the possibility of doubt that ices and buns formed a luncheon particularly agreeable to miss tolbridge but it was still too early for this and therefore after leaving the great rooms they strolled into one of the smaller ones in which were exhibited flower pieces plans of porticos and palaces and drawings of various descriptions as there was still a good half hour to be worn away before there was any chance of their finding ice ready judith sat herself to examine the walls systematically and while thus engaged she came upon a small drawing neatly mounted which looked more fitted for the pages of a lady's album than for the walls of the royal academy but which nevertheless struck her as being singularly graceful and picturesque had judith ever been at rome she would have instantly recognized in this little colored sketch the well-known steps of the piazza di spagna with its usual groups of black-eyed children about equally remarkable for dirt and picturesque costume and all holding themselves ready to obey the beckon of the first artist who might chance to want them in his studio the drawing was slight but brilliant and very graceful both in composition and execution she looked at it long and then passed on but nothing else detained her attention much and again she returned to it 
On this second examination, it appeared to her still more interesting and more effective in its masterly but slight finishing than at first. And having given up her catalogue to Miss Tolbridge, she asked her to turn to number 1695 and tell her what she found there. Miss Tolbridge obeyed her instantly and read very distinctly these words. Sketch of well-known models from the steps in the Piazza di Spagna at Rome. Charles Worthington, number blank, Newman Street, Oxford Street. Judith uttered a cry that drew upon her all the eyes in the room. Fortunately, they were not many, and as she had sufficient presence of mind to seat herself immediately, and to hide her agitated features amidst the draperies of her friend who immediately drew near her, she escaped any very obvious attention. But the moment was, indeed, one that might well overthrow her fortitude. The search after her aunt, hitherto so vain, ever held by her as so sacred an enterprise from having been enjoined by the last words of her mother, was at last successful and that at a time when she had almost begun to think it hopeless. The first faint weakness of a too sudden emotion being passed, her feelings were all made up of joy and thankfulness, and she could with difficulty restrain herself from giving such outward demonstrations of this joy as might have made both it and herself more conspicuous than would have been desirable. But what was she to do? What was she to do first? Fly to them without a moment's delay was the answer that her heart gave to this question. But she did not want to have Miss Tolbridge. She did not want to have anybody present at her first interview with her aunt. That good, kind friend stood looking at her with such an expression of mixed astonishment and anxiety on her features as made it absolutely necessary that she should, in some way, explain to her what was passing in her mind. But the thing was by no means easy, for not only had she to get rid of Miss Tolbridge, but she felt that under all ordinary circumstances, her next step ought to be to inform her Aunt Elfrida of the discovery she'd made, and invite her to take Miss Tolbridge's place and accompany her instantly to Newman Street. But the thought of doing this fell upon her heart like ice. All the cold, harsh anger, the cruel indifference with which every mention, every allusion to her Aunt Penelope had been always met by her maiden sisters recurred to her so strongly that she felt she should be doing Mrs. Worthington an injury rather than a kindness if she forced upon her the visit of Miss Elfrida at the same time as her own. It's wonderful to see with what rapidity circumstances will assist in developing character at the age when childhood is giving place to adolescence. A few moments suffice to awaken in the heart and head of Judith a multitude of faculties which had never been in action there before, and the result was that she turned to her uneasy-looking friend with a kind smile and said, I am afraid I frightened you, my dear Miss Tolbridge, because I have been startled myself. I have found in the catalogues of artists' names one that interests me greatly, because it's one that would have interested my mother. But if it proves to be the person I hope it is, the discovery will be a very pleasant one, and therefore it's only joy that has overpowered me. I will take you home now, if you will let me, and then I will set myself soberly to think of what steps it will be best to take in order to ascertain whether I am right or wrong in my conjecture. Miss Tolbridge immediately prepared to accompany her downstairs, but she looked into her face inquiringly, and as Judith said no more, she ventured to observe, as the carriage door closed upon them, that of course Judith would want to go home directly in order to consult her Aunt Elfrida. "'I'll tell you what must be done before anybody is consulted,' replied Judith, with such gay indifference of tone as greatly to tranquilize the spirits of her companion." We must drive to Ferrance's, Miss Tolbridge, and she gave the necessary order to the servant. You must not be cheated out of your luncheon, because I've seen in the catalogue a name with which my mother was acquainted. But when the carriage stopped, 
Poor Judith felt that she had no power to wait for the deliberate disappearance of a mountain of ice under the cautious teaspoon of Miss Tolbridge. And therefore, with the considerable tincture of her newborn decision of character, she checked the footman when he was about to open the door, saying, No, Thomas, no, we shall not get out today. Tell him to put half a dozen bath buns, and we will take them in the carriage. Had Judith been tempted by any circumstance to make such an alteration in her usual arrangements a few hours before, it might have been done, perhaps, but it would have been done differently. And trifling as the occurrence was, Miss Tolbridge felt this difference to a degree that would have greatly astonished Judith had she been aware of it, for she was perfectly unconscious of any such change herself. But had she pressed her own hand upon her own bosom at that moment, she would have become conscious at least she was not likely to do or say anything in an ordinary way. Store Street, said Judith, as she received the packet of buns, and to Store Street, where the lodgings of Miss Tolbridge were situated, the carriage drove, and reached it almost without the two ladies having exchanged a word. Miss Tolbridge could not imagine why Judith was so silent, but Judith was not in the least degree aware either of her own silence or that of her companion. At length Miss Tolbridge and the buns were safely deposited in Store Street, and the door of the house closed upon them. Judith distinctly pronounced the words, Number blank, Newman Street, and the carriage was again in motion. It would be no easy task to describe the condition of the young girl during the short interval that now elapsed before the carriage again stopped. It was not without a very considerable effort that she was able to pronounce intelligibly, Inquire if Mrs. Worthington is at home. This ends Chapter 1 of Petticoat Government, Volume 3, by Francis Milton Trollope.